This week, I received a video of my niece. Her parents had taken her to see the Super Mario Brothers movie, which apparently she's into Super Mario Brothers, so she doesn't really play the video game. She just likes the image of the cartoon characters. And in any case, uh, the theme song came on, and in the middle of the theater, my niece got up and just started dancing. And I mean, this wasn't like a little like kind of jig. This was like, a, you know, she was enraptured by this theme song to this movie. And my sister filmed this and sent it around to the family. And it was like the joy, the pleasure that my niece was taking in that movie was contagious. We all felt that by being able to witness Margot feeling that. I think that childhood is a great place to start when talking about pleasure. When a child experiences an activity as pleasurable, they pursue it. Uh, try to take them away from a game or a dance that they're enraptured by and just see how well that goes over. <laughs> There's probably gonna be some tears. <laughs> and then try to imagine what eating is like for a young child. Do young children worry about BMI and weight gain and body shape? No, no, they don't worry about those things. Unexposed to cultural messages about those things, they simply eat what tastes good and they stop when they are full. Now think about the times that a child wants physical contact, wants to snuggle. Do they um, have a ton of messages and know kind of when it's appropriate to do that and when it's not appropriate to do that? No. And so they might just, you know, come up to their caregiver in the middle of a shopping mall or the middle of a church service and give them a hug and want to be held and want to be snuggled. They follow their own sense of what is pleasurable in those moments and those impulses to pleasure help them to have a full life as a child, help them to experience the love and um, just fullness of being alive in their own bodies. These simple pleasures guide them towards what will feel right in the moment. And that pleasure helps them to lead a good and full life for someone their age, one where they are nourished, cared for, and engaged with the world. Too much of religion undoes trust for basic pleasure. This undoing has been read into the story from Genesis. Their pleasure was freely available to Adam and Eve. However, once they defied God and ate the fruit of knowledge, they were cast out of the garden of pleasure. After that, they were made to toil for their survival. This script says human beings are made for discipline and work and effort in a post-Edenic world. Once we hit adulthood, it's time to leave the pleasure paradise behind. And when we do experience pleasure, we should be quite suspicious that we're doing something wrong or mischievous, um, that we're not killing ourselves hard enough for work. Sometimes pithy quotes can capture a truth that is hard to explain with a, a lot of verbosity. And so I have a few of them that capture this basic fear of pleasure. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said that Christianity fed Eros poison. And while the poison did not kill Eros, it degenerated Eros and weakened Eros into pathetic vice. In other words, the experience of pleasure, this thing that should make us feel alive and whole and give us guidance about what is good in life is reduced to little sins that we need to be forgiven for. I think Mephistopheles would know all about that. <laughs> and then here's another pithy quote. 
this time from the writer H.L. Mencken, it's that Puritanism, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere is having a good time. <laughs> Of course, these pleasure negative messages are not the whole story in our culture. Indeed, we live in a confused culture. Commodity capitalism is all about convincing you that you should desire more and not less. It says that you do not have enough pleasure in your life. You do not have enough things that bring you pleasure in your life. And we live with the reality of capitalism that tries to convince us that the next perfect indulgence is just over the horizon, just out of reach of us. And to produce those pleasures, it distorts pleasure along the way. You can never have enough of what is being sold. Each time you get something that should be a satisfaction, it just leads to more yearning and feeling that you don't have enough. And people and the environment get crushed along the way. Clothes come from sweatshops. Sex becomes exploitative porn. Food becomes environmental destruction. Enjoyment turns into addiction. This is pleasure through the prism of unhappy social dynamics. Welcome to capitalism in the 21st century. Has anybody seen the movie The Menu? No, a few people, all right, great. I recommend it. I thought it was quite compelling. Um, make sure you're in the mood for something troubling <laughs> before you watch it. <laughs> Uh, this film came out last year, and it's about a high-end restaurant. And it depicts in exquisite detail the dishes that are served up to the elite clients. And these are incredible creations to behold. One dish has a blue pumice rock with an oyster perched perfectly on top, ornamented by edible green reeds that had come from the shore. It looks like a piece of the shore. It is a work of art. And yet this pleasurable commodity is not made with pleasure. Instead, the film depicts the misery of the people who slave away to produce the creations for the wealthy clients. It hints at environmental destruction, poor living conditions for the workers, abuse of animals, and the alienation of the chef who is forced to create more and more obscure oddities for his fickle clientele. And the clients themselves don't even really seem to have a lot of pleasure in the eating. They are more concerned with the cachet of eating in the fancy restaurant than the taste of the dishes themselves. This film perfectly encapsulates capitalism where pleasure gets spoiled for everybody. If Christianity has fed us a line of BS, then so has capitalism. Because when I think of the things that bring me the most pleasure in life, the things that make me truly happy, often these are freely or cheaply available. The simple taste of a strawberry that has grown in my garden, the tender kiss from my husband, a deep and long conversation with a friend, the joy of working side by side with a community that is doing good for others in the community. A walk through Ryerson Woods just as nature is coming back to life. These are simple pleasures that make me feel alive and whole, that quicken my pulse. These things are reliable and good and true. And I feel like so much of what we have been offered and told will give us pleasures are distractions from those kinds of pleasures. Think about the 80th time you have checked social media just today. Has it led to more pleasure? Probably not. <laughs> Gail read a curious parable about Jesus from Jesus this morning. 
and it occurs in the Gospel of Luke. In this story, a man is preparing a great feast for his friends. And one by one, he receives the regrets that his friends have to give him. They give him a host of excuses about why they will not come to enjoy the things that he is freely offering them. And so the man says, fine, I'm gonna throw open the doors to everybody else. Anybody who wants to come in can eat the food. And those who gave a bunch of excuses won't get to experience any of it. Now, while Christianity may have fed Eros poison, Jesus had a much more interesting and nuanced message than that. He spoke of taking pleasure from the abundance and the beauty of life. He spoke of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. So it makes me wonder if this parable is not spoken in the same vein. What if Jesus is saying, look all around at you, you will see the fullness of life and joy and goodness. Why are you choosing to refuse them today? Why don't you see their gracious abundance that is all around you? And then there is critique built into this as well. The critique of those who deny pleasure to themselves or to others. This theology calls us to the rush of the sensual at the same time that it critiques those who turn away from it or distort it. My spiritual companions, what if the doors to the banquet halls are wide open? What if all we have to do is walk through them? What if all we must do is welcome that simple rush of pleasure that is offered up to us every day? What if what we have been told about pleasure being bad or distracting or beside the point is all wrong? What if the pleasures of life, the pleasures of biting into a strawberry, of kissing or making love to a partner, of having long and deep conversations with a good friend, of experiencing the natural world and all of its beauty point us to the blessing and the sacredness of life and being. What if life was always meant to be that simple and to feel that good? The thing is, I know that if it were that simple and that good, I would not want to be one of the people who's been left out. Surely, I tell you, not one of those who was invited will get a taste of the banquet. I don't want to be invited and not get a taste of the banquet, to have that kind of pleasure at my fingertips, and then simply to fail to notice it. That just sounds awful. I don't want that to be me. So today, Let's choose differently. We are going to do a communion of the senses. I wanted to call this a pleasure communion in the order of service, but I was afraid people might get the wrong idea. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. That pleasure is good and holy, too, and I'll be the first to say that, but it's just not what we're doing here. <laughs> this communion of the senses is an invitation to gustatory pleasure to the pleasure of eating. And so during the music, I invite you to come up, take one of the berries, have a seat, and as the music plays, bite into that berry and experience the savor of it. Let it be meditative and prayerful. Don't just eat it, experience the magnificence of simple taste. And if you do have trouble coming up to get a berry, please raise your hand during the music and we will bring one up for you. And now before we come up for our communion of the senses, I will offer a prayer. Spirit of life, kindle your fire within us. Make our senses flush with life. Make our nerves awaken with electricity. Make our blood surge through all of those lanes on the way to the heart and our heart. May it 
pound for each moment's blossoming. May the scent of the new baby, the sight of flowers assembled, the sound of birdsong in mid-April, the touch of the lips of one that you love, the taste of a strawberry call us back to the sacred pleasures of life. May we never forget that these pleasures are freely available to us. May they call us always to celebrate the sensuality of existence, the beautiful skin of the world, the banquet that is free for all, and the goodness of our bodies. The goodness of our bodies. And may we find ever new ways to ensure the availability of pleasure for ourselves, for others, and for future generations. Let that prayer live not only in the breath of our words, but in the fiber of our muscles, our bones, our blood, and our being. Each moment a gateway into the pleasures of being fully alive. Spirit of life, let us quicken fully into life. Amen. Oh.